winter gardening. Our presenter is Kathy Watts. Kathy has lived and worked in the Verde Valley for over 30 years. Her professional background is rooted primarily in hospitality and the food beverage industry. As food has always been her favorite thing, garden naturally has become a serious interest when Kathy retired from the res restaurant business. She has grown food in a variety of ways, including indoors, grow bags, unconventional containers, sub-irrigated planters, raised beds, and of course the traditional in-ground gardens. All have their challenges, which makes gardening all the more interesting. And she is here to help navigate those challenges. She has recently completed her Yavapai County Master Gardening Training and hopes to help you achieve your gardening goals. With that, Kathy, welcome and you can take it away. Hi, welcome everyone. I hope that uh, this presentation helps you with your winter gardening endeavors. Um, this is my first presentation, so I appreciate your patience and interest, of course, in the subject. So let's go ahead and get started. So hold on a second. Why is this, hang on. Ah. All right, I'm gonna click. Okay, here we are. Uh, this is how you can get in touch with the, uh, the Master Gardener Association, the Avapai County Cooperative Extension. Um, these are some different links and email addresses that you can use to ask questions, uh, ask your gardening questions of really knowledgeable science-based um, uh, gardeners and experts in the field. Uh, so tonight's main topics that I'm going to be going over um, are growing greens and vegetables uh, during the cooler winter months in central Arizona, Yavapai County, um, methods for improving and protecting your soil and prepping for the next season. Uh, if you choose not to garden in the winter, there are many things you can do to improve your gardening uh, for in the, in the spring and summer of next year and growing microgreens indoors, which is something that um, you know many people do indoors uh, in the winter time when, when climate gets to be a bit cold or dark. And uh, you actually can grow microgreens year, all year round, but for us, it's for me, it's a little better in the winter time because it's easier to control the indoor temperatures. They don't get too hot. Uh, so growing greens and vegetables in the garden, most important thing is choosing a good location for your garden. Uh, in the summer or in the winter time, uh, the sun is in a different position and the, they're kind of a, a longer ray, I guess. Actually, they're not. They, I think that, no, they are longer rays, sorry, uh, in, the, in the winter time. Um, but there is uh, southern horizon is where the sun is at. So you have a different angle uh, for sunshine. And it's important that your, your plants get as many uh, hours of sunshine as possible. Uh, caring for the soil is also important um, when, uh, when growing in the, in the winter time. And selecting plants and seeds that are suitable for uh, winter temperatures um, is uh, another aspect of, of planning your winter garden and protection from the elements. So this would mean uh, row covers, cloches, uh, hot caps, things of that nature. So when you're choosing a location, you wanna look for an area that has Southern exposure to the midday sun, which is from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So you can see in this graphic how the sun uh, is high in the sky during the summertime and lower in the sky during the winter. And so the, the trajectory does not allow for as many uh, sunny hours. And it's it, with cooler temperatures um, that, that makes it a little bit more difficult to grow. The days are shorter and um, as are the, the, as is the growing, the growing window, I guess. Uh, you wanna make sure that your location is protectable from the elements and from animals. Uh, rotation of plants from the previous season is also something to consider. Uh, you want to make sure that um, the, you're, not, you're not growing uh, plants that, that may 
either draw the same nutrients out of the soil or uh, they, they add something back when, uh, when you're growing in the winter so that you have a better, you have a better growing season following it in the spring. So the rotation is very important. And it also, sometimes it does help with uh, preventing diseases. And uh, again, with, uh, uh, with adding nutrients back into the soil. Soil quality is important, and so is access to water. These are all critical elements of choosing a location for your winter garden and actually for your garden at any time. So caring for the soil, when we're heading into the winter time, and we wanna make sure that uh, we take a look at the soil after you've been growing in the summer and check to see if you've got some good organic matter, if you need to add more back in. Look at the vibrancy of the soil. For example, this, this graphic shows worms and other little microscopic creatures that are probably living underneath that soil. Um, and you wanna make sure that you continue to add back nutrients and elements that will feed those, uh, the microorganisms because that's a vital element in, uh, in creating uh, uh, useful and constructive soil. You wanna, um, you wanna remove plants from the previous season, but typically I like to uh, take off the tops of the plants and leave the root structure in and maybe turn it under a little bit because again, those are things that those uh, organisms do like to eat. And that, that does add to the structure of the soil. Um, you wanna make any necessary soil amendments at this time. So adding a little bit of compost or fertilizer, especially if you've been growing in that same space uh, for the spring and summer and adding some uh, organic matter. And you do, we do like to keep the soil covered because that's a protection kind of like a, a coat in the winter time. Uh, fertilizing, oopsie, looks like part of this is gone. Uh, I have to apologize because I'm missing part of my presentation here. Uh, so fertilizing, this is a chicken, which it represents chicken manure, uh, which I do like to use that in the garden. Uh, the chicken manure is, um, it's been dried and processed so that it's not, it won't burn the garden. Um, with those are also uh, some pellets. So alfalfa pellets are kind of a sneaky way of adding nitrogen back into your soil. They break down slowly and they add um, nutrients at a good pace without burning, uh, without burning other plants, burning plants in there. And then also uh, that's a chemical fertilizer in the bag. It represents chemical fertilizer. And um, you can add that back into your soil if, if, uh, if, that's, yeah, if that's your choice. But the important thing is, is making sure the soil has the nutrients for your winter plants. Oh, look at that. There you go. Sorry. Um, okay. so. Uh, you, what you want to do is add two to three pounds of a slow release fertilizer uh, per 100 square feet of garden. And both chemical and organic varieties, as I said before, are available for this. Uh, you want a higher potassium count because um, that helps to protect from the winter cold. So when we were talking earlier about rotating crops from the previous season, this was a really helpful graphic that I pulled up from another uh, presentation on winter gardening, the Master Gardener, uh, on the Master Gardener website. You can really jump in at any point, depending on your season, uh, with, with uh, one of these items. So you want to grow, uh, see roots uh, before fruit, before greens, before beans. So uh, the, this rotation is um, ideal for uh, your plant rotation in the garden. So plant choice considerations um, would be, sorry, um, would be uh, time to germinate. So you want to select winter plants that are gonna germinate at, at the right time uh, based on the time that you're planting them. So you want to get them started and growing uh, before excuse me, uh, before it gets too cold. And so they have a chance to get established uh, before it gets too cold and before the sunshine or the sun, the daytime hours. Oh, thank you. 
me get my notes. Before the the uh, the daytime hours are so short that they and they get established. Um, you want to you want to know how many days it takes for them to germinate and how long it takes before the plant reaches maturity. This is part of your plant, plant selection process. Uh, how tall or big does the plant get? Um, because again, you don't wanna plant short plants behind tall plants because that would shade them and prevent them from succeeding in the garden. Um, and which is better? Is it to plant a seed or the starter plant based on some of these factors, which is how long it takes for them to germinate and the time to maturity. And you would, you would, uh, sorry, it would be a waste if you started with a seed and by the time your plant matured and bore fruit or was ready to harvest, uh, it was too late and you'd be getting ready to plant for springtime. Um, I like to plant from the expect, I like to plan from the expected harvest date and work my way backwards so that I know whether I should start with a seed or a starter plant. So I kind of work my way backwards with that. Um, all right. So this is a really handy chart on maturation rate. So it shows uh, which plants quickly mature, which are moderate maturation rate and which are a slower maturation rate. So these are things that you really need to take into consider when, when planning your garden. Uh, cauliflower and things of that nature, you probably wanna start those guys uh, from plant starts so that you have enough time in the season for them to actually you know, bear the, the head. So this is um, selecting seasonal plants and seeds. Uh, so fall and winter seeds can be directly sown into the soil if you get them in, you know, in the early fall, while soil temperatures are still above 40 degrees, because it's most seeds need at least that temperature to germinate. So this is a nice list of some uh, different choices that will grow in the winter time in our area. So here's some cold hardy uh, vegetable varieties. This is another, another slide on that. Um, I've grown well, several of these uh, successfully in, in the Verde Valley. I live in Cornville. And this is a, a place where you can find your seeds. It's if you search online, I, I think I've purchased from a variety of different sources online. Um, and uh, you just search for cold tolerant seeds when you go to those different sites. And um, you should also uh, make sure that it says fall is the correct planting time for your seeds. And um, you wanna check the soil temperatures dictated on the seed packets or in the seed information before uh, putting them in the ground. So in putting it all together, you want to, um, you want to plant your slower uh, maturing vegetables in mid-August and plant your moderate to maturing vegetables in September. I, th I think this is probably in the higher elevations like Prescott and plant quick maturing vegetables in October, which um, you wanna plant those in early October. So you, you uh, get them established before it starts to turn too cold. And uh, if you go to the uh, Yavapai County Extension Office or the Extension website, the Master Gardener website, you'll find a lot of these really helpful charts that give you some ideas in terms of uh, temperature and growing conditions for our area. So here it says that um, it has a probability for freezes on these particular dates. This is Prescott. And uh, that helps you with, with uh, determining when you need to get your plants in the ground, get your seeds started. And this is cottonwood. 
So as you can see, here's your fall. And uh, this is your probability here for having a frost. And uh, we definitely want to get your stuff in the ground. Wow, definitely before here. And your average growing season in, in uh, cotton was 194 days. So that also helps you with planning which, which uh, plants you want to grow in the wintertime. So protection from the elements, this is really important. Uh, low tunnels and row covers and floating row covers, uh, cold frames, cloches and hot caps, walls of water, which I've really only used those in the summertime uh, for tomatoes or springtime to get my tomatoes started early. And then another topic is overwintering your spring or summer vegetables. I have uh, I've done this with both tomatoes and peppers with some pretty, pretty good success. Um, and even though uh, the, co the cold hardy plants are suited for winter gardening, they'll likely need some protection uh, for best results. These are the most common choices. I'll, I'll be going over them with you in a second here for protecting your plants from the elements. So this is a low tunnel. You can see these are some, this is bent conduit here, electrical conduit. Um, they have tools that you can buy in different garden supplies that will help you take the electrical conduit and bend it into that shape, depending on the size of your garden bed. And what we did was we put rebar in the ground and then bent the conduit so that it would slip over the rebar and hold it in place. Now you can also buy clips that will hold um, this, uh, this cover on. This is uh, an Agrabon floating row cover, and that helps to insulate the plants from cold. And it also in the summertime or in warmer months, it helps to protect them from, uh, from excessive heat and, and the burning part of the sun. So, um, you definitely want to remove them when the temperatures uh, rise above 55 or if it starts to rain, uh, because it, otherwise it'll collapse down on the plants. But um, you can vent them if the, if the temperatures are above 40. So these are some instructions on how to, and the tools that you would need or the parts you would need to uh, build a, a, a low tunnel. And they're fairly inexpensive and they make a huge difference. So this is, um, this is a row cover, a floating row cover. And they usually have a hoop. Oh, I'm sorry, this is, um, this is the floating row cover. Sorry about that. Um, the material that, that we use for a floating row cover is extremely light. And it doesn't, it, you can use it as a protective shield on the plants, um, usually vegetables, and primarily from the undesirable effects of cold and wind. And you can, it also helps to protect them a bit from insect damage if you have insects in the, in the winter time. Um, it's rated by light transmission and cold protection. And um, it's extremely lightweight. So it, uh, it can be placed directly over the plants without a need for supporting framework, which makes it even simpler to use than, doing a, than using a, a low tunnel. Um, and what you would do is just anchor the edges with a brick or rocks or stakes of some sort to keep it from, uh, from blowing away. Now these are cold frames uh, and they, uh, you can make them out of a variety of different materials, a lot of DIY type uh, materials. For example, this, these uh, straw bales down here with a glass inserts over the top, uh, those are probably just um, repurposed windows that you can use to help uh, protect your plants, allowing the sun to come through and uh, give them sunlight while, while still uh, uh, protecting them from the cold. Now, um, I would probably, it, on warmer days, I would definitely remove those so that you don't burn your plants. Um, I've, had, uh, I've used ice chests, as a matter of fact, for a uh, cold frame. And the ice chests were great because the, they insulated the soil as well. So they kept soil temperatures a little warmer and then they were easy to cover with uh, plastic. Now these are cloches or hot caps and they, um, 
as you can see, this one's made from an old beverage bottle, soda bottle, something like that, and cut in half and then placed directly over the plants. And it has a nice vent at the top, which keeps the condensation from building up inside and does allow for some of the excess heat to escape. Um, they can be made from just about anything. And it's um, uh, critical to remember, oops, to take them off when the, when the temperatures rise. And um, you can also, you should also anchor these down. Now, one method of doing that is uh, poking holes in the sides of the bottle and using uh, like a small stake to anchor them down into the ground so that it kind of protects them from either being knocked over by, by critters or getting blown over. And a hot cap is made from fabric. So it's like a little tent as opposed to this enclosure, which is something that is hard and, and uh, something that's got a little bit more structure to it. The tent is uh, kind of like a mini uh, low tunnel or, you know, sort of a row cover, that same type of fabric, only it's got a little structure in there. And these are the walls there, which um, you can see a tomato plant inside. These are very popular in the springtime when temperatures are, are low uh, to help get plants a, a nice start. Um, it gives the same effect as a greenhouse and uh, it gives off heat, which is stored in the water to uh, protect from cool air and freezes. These are uh, peppers, which they can be overwintered. Um, this was my first experiment was last year using them, uh, using pillowcases. So what we did here is we put a tomato cage over a trimmed down uh, tomato or pepper plant. So we cut the, we, we prune the, the pepper plant down into just little nubs basically, and then put the tomato cage over the top and put a pillowcase over the top of that and then placed it next to a south facing wall, which acted as a heat sink. And uh, so in the, in the winter time, the sun would warm the wall and would keep the plant uh, at a warmer temperature and keep it from freezing. And the next year, well, this is my, uh, this is a row of pepper plants being stored against a south facing wall, the picture there at the bottom. And uh, they all came back and produced nicely this year. So it's another way of extending that season on your, on your pepper plants. And then uh, strawberries, again, they would, they benefit from being mulched in and protecting them from, from hard freezes. And I like to use pine needles because, um, well, they are, they tend to be more acidic and as they break down, hopefully they add some acidity to my soil because it's very alkaline and the strawberries do much better uh, when we have a little bit, uh, when we add some acidic elements to it. So uh, instead of growing vegetables, if you choose to do, uh, to just support your soil over the winter time, um, you can give the garden a rest and just, you know, improve the soil and feed the, the, uh, microorganisms that live there, keep it protected. So here are a few methods for improving the soil. Uh, first, removing the old, the tops of the old plants from the previous garden that's spent, and you leave in the root system, because the root system also helps to uh, keep that soil broken up and allow oxygen to, uh, to enter and keeps it from being too compacted. Uh, topping the soil with compost, alfalfa pellets or cubes adds back nitrogen to, uh, to help support, the, to help support the, the health of the soil. Um, keeping the soil damp during the winter months, not, not drenched wet, but damp, again, helps to support the ecosystem there. And then, of course, covering the soil with either brown mulch or a green or living mulch uh, helps, again, to support the soil while feeding it. Uh, so brown mulch, you can choose, um, there's a variety of different things that you can use. And I think what we have pictured here are just leaves or straw. 
Uh, so choosing an organic matter that breaks down and feeds the soil um, is a good choice. It's an excellent choice. Now you can also use plastic uh, as, a, as a mulch to protect the soil and keep it covered over the winter time, but it doesn't really add nutrients or organic matter back in, which is why I typically choose to use either uh, leaves or uh, straw or pine needles as well. So um, a green or living mulch, excuse me, uh, is a growing mulch. So you would actually plant the seeds uh, of, a, of a legume and say a, a cereal rye is the one that we have here. Um, and that helps to, the, the rye helps to establish a root system because the rye has deep roots that keeps the soil from being eroded from wind or, or heavy rains, while the hairy vetch, which is a legume, is a nitrogen fixer, which pulls nitrogen from the air and sinks it down into the soil. And again, it adds a richness and um, supports the organisms that grow there. So what you would do is uh, inoculate your vetch seeds with an inoculum that is a bacteria and helps to um, get the, the legume seed established and started and uh, gives it a really good start. And about three to four weeks before planting, you would, uh, you would cut down the, uh, the mulch, the growing mulch, and then turn it in to the soil. So here's a uh, hairy vetch. This is what it looks like when it's pretty mature. And these nodes up here at the top, those are uh, the nitrogen fixers that uh, help to, they swallow and they help to establish, they help to, to draw the nitrogen back into the soil. Oh, I just lost something. Sorry. Okay. Oops. This is the cereal rye. And uh, this is what it looks like when it's, well, it's actually seeding out here. Um, I would probably cut it before it does that. Oh, my goodness. And uh, this is what the uh, cover crop looks like in April. This is Prescott. And this is uh, this is before you would mow it and turn it into uh, turn it into your garden soil. So you can see it's pretty tall here. It's good. I don't know, two and a half feet. And this is what it looks like after you've chopped it down, mowed it, let it, everything lay, and then uh, here on the left we see where it's been uh, turned into the soil and it starts to decompose and break down and, and does its magic. In the meantime, through the winter, uh, the soil has been protected and it's being fed. So other prep for the next season, which is if you're, if you're just going to focus on uh, soil care in the winter time instead of growing food, uh, other prep that you can do for the for the following season would be saving seeds from uh, spring and summer plants. Um, I saved uh, pollinator and food plant seeds uh, so that we that we did that in the fall to as part of our winter prep for the following season. You clear away dead plant matter. So this is more of a housekeeping uh, housekeeping task. And that pre it prevents disease and it discourages pests from taking up residence in your garden. And uh, pruning and mulching the perennials, trimming them down as we did with the, uh, with the peppers. And having plant covers on hand for extra cold weather is another uh, task for the winter time. And then keeping your garden journal and updating it uh, is another good winter task. Um, getting it ready for, getting yourself ready for the following season. You can log some of the information that you, uh, that you learned and your experiences from growing in the previous season. So saving seeds, this was um, some Tahitian melon squash that I grew this year. And they're pretty spectacular. They taste kind of like a banana squash. 
and uh, we, I was able to see to save a, a lot of seeds. And as you can see, I made a note on the seed package because it it made a lot of male flowers and not a whole lot of female flowers. So uh, we didn't have a huge harvest, but what we did get was pretty spectacular. And then here on the side is on the right, you'll see our zinnias and um, uh, butterflies absolutely went crazy. Butterflies and bees love these flowers. So I saved those uh, again for, for the following season because they did well in my garden and um, may not do well in everyone's garden, but I guess we're our own experts uh, for our own garden space because everyone's different. So this is some of the dead matter that I just trimmed off and left the plants underneath, the roots underneath to help support the, the soil and uh, continue to support the organisms that live there. Uh, pruning and mulching your perennials. Uh, this is important for the health of your perennials. Excuse me, just a sec. Uh, it stimulates them for uh, for spring growth and also trimming back some of the, the top plant matter helps to prevent uh, disease and things of that nature. So this is, this is uh, just a good housekeeping task in the winter time. It can be done. And then plant or tree covers. Uh, the, the, on the left here, we see some different bags that you can buy on, for, from agricultural supplies and plant supplies, and they kind of have a drawstring at the bottom, and you can buy them in different sizes. And they work well uh, to help protect your plants in the winter from super cool temperatures. And then on the right here is a picture of a, of a fitted sheet that's being repurposed and covers one of the, uh, the square foot gardens. And so just about anything that works, you know, it, bed sheets, tablecloths, things like that, you can use to uh, cover your plants in the wintertime. So it's a good idea to have those on hand and, and ready to go because sometimes those frosts, they sneak up on you. And uh, keeping a garden journal. Now, hang on just a second as I find my notes here because I'm getting a little bit behind. This was my garden journal. And I, will, I like to put in, um, in plastic covers some of the important stuff that's pretty consistent. You use it season after season. And these are the uh, Yavapai County vegetable planting date sheets that I got from the website, from the uh, extension website. And this is a guide that I always like to have on hand. It's, it's uh, very thorough and very helpful in planting, in planning our uh, planting. Oops, here we are. Um, I like to keep the labels from different plants or different varieties that I've tried. Uh, and then I'll make notes on the back so I know whether or not to get those varieties again. And then finally, we're gonna move on to the, uh, the microgreen section. They're easy to grow inside and they grow quickly, like seven to 10 days and you have food. And uh, there's lots of different flavors and varieties that you can kind of mix and match and, and play with. So these are the supplies for growing microgreens. Um, and they, these are not hard and fast, gotta have, because um, you can repurpose a lot of different containers uh, that you might already have around the house to, uh, to grow microgreens. Uh, but this is a tray, and typically when you're growing a, like a 10 by 20 uh, tray of microgreens, this will be a two-part uh, setup where the top has holes in it and the bottom is, is a water vessel so that you, it'll hold water and you can pour it in there as the, uh, as the plants, as the, as the greens get taller and, and they establish a greater root system. But uh, I've grown microgreens in... Uh, plastic trays that were repurposed like salad trays, 
something that if you buy a, a plastic uh, or a plastic container that you would buy salad in or something like that. Uh, you can use those because they're kind of actually very handy because they've got the plastic cover over the top and they help to keep the warmth inside. Um, so, and then you would have a, a jar of some sort to soak your seeds, a uh, spray bottle that you can mist your, your microgreens with to keep from uh, moving the soil around too much because they, they'll, uh, you want to make sure that it's just kind of a mist when you spray your, your, your little babies. And then um, you have a grow medium, a good light uh, for, uh, for exposing them to, and then a shelving unit or a place for, the, of course, the plants to rest. Um, different types of grow medium that I've used is coconut core. I've used peat moss. I've used actually even a seed starting mix, and you can use uh, grow mats. So, uh, and then seeds are another important element, obviously, for growing your microgreens. And they come in a different package uh, than you would normally get, say, from, you know, Home Depot or something that you would have a little package of seeds for your garden. Uh, these come in a much larger package so that you can, and a great deal more in there, and they're a better deal uh, so that you can uh, get a nice thick growth of microgreens. So here's a, a little block of coconut core. And what you would do is you would soak this and get it all broken apart before you'd use it to, uh, to get your microgreens started. In the back behind there, you can see what that's what it looks like after you've soaked it and let it break apart. And this is a shelving unit that I have in my kitchen. And those are just, they're inexpensive LED lights. And uh, that's kind of a little grow setup that I have right here on the, well, I guess it's the, the second shelf up from the bottom. Um, that is some, those are some microgreens that I was growing last year for, for, uh, for food. And this is a package of what uh, microgreen seeds look like. Um, there's lots of different sources online. You can just, you can search for those. And I believe this is a one pound package. And this was a superfood microgreen mix. And the only thing I would say is I would make sure that the mix, they germinate at relatively close to the same type time because you can have some where half the seeds have germinated and doing really well and the other ones are just getting their start, which that does tend to mess up your harvest time. Um, some are going to be a little bit bigger and some are smaller, so you kind of have to wait till they all get caught up. So this is a germination to harvest timetable. And again, you can find these on the different seed sites, seed uh, sellers websites, and it helps you in choosing, you know, which ones can go together in the same tray or which ones will meet your needs in terms of, you know, when you want to, uh, when you want to eat them, how you want to rotate them. So you may want to follow, you know, arugula with, uh, with beets or something like that, depending on, on your, your time frame. So here's an example of uh, growing microgreens. This is how you start. You would uh, soak your seeds in water, probably about 12 hours. Sometimes I like to add a little squirt of hydrogen peroxide in there. Um, it kind of helps get the seeds started. Um, you fill up the growing container with about three quarters of an inch of grow medium, whichever one you choose. Uh, don't use anything that's not, um, don't use garden soil or anything like that. Use something, if you're gonna use like a starter mix, make sure it's been sterilized uh, because you don't want any microorganisms necessarily in this soil. Uh, this is going to be, you know, a fresh to eat uh, raw type of food. So you want to make sure that you don't have, you know, manures or anything like that in your soil when you're growing microgreens. The, the seed has all of the nutrients it needs to get a good start. Uh, this is the, um, this is the next phase. You'll sprinkle um, the growing medium with your soaked seed uh, and then really dampen that soil again and uh, get, every, get everything nice and, and damp, but not soaking wet. 
If you get it soaking wet, then uh, your seeds have a chance of rotting and it, they won't perform well. Then the next thing you do is you cover that, in, that tray with another inverted tray or a plastic cloth to darken, uh, darken the space until they germinate. It simulates being underground. Some growers actually, uh, they will invert that tray and place a brick on it, believe it or not. It makes it, you would think that that would crush the seeds or prevent them from, uh, from growing, but it actually helps to uh, drive the roots a little bit deeper down into the soil uh, and that they are actually a little bit sturdier plant. Uh, once the microgreens, once they germinate and cotyledons appear after about three to five days, you're gonna want to uncover and expose them to light for about 12 hours a day. Now this is where it gets handy to have a shelf with uh, lighting above it. You can, you can place the, something underneath the tray to get it a little bit closer to the light so they, they're not quite as leggy um, in the beginning. You want them to get a nice, uh, nice sturdy root it's established so that um, you can, they're, they're, they're a little bit more robust. Um, and about seven to 10 days after planting, they're, they're ready to go. And you can, uh, you can harvest those after they've uh, germinated, you can harvest those, those uh, microgreens and enjoy them. So this shows harvesting the microgreens. Now this person here is using a sharp knife and you just cut it off just above the, the soil line and um, scissors can be used as well. Now I like to, when I'm growing pea shoots, I'll trim them down like this and then continue to water them and you'll get a second harvest. It won't be quite as thick, but you can get a second harvest out of uh, pea shoots, out of the peas. So uh, when you're, uh, Winter, gar winter gardening, to me, it also means that you're planning for the springtime. So you can uh, use your winter growing knowledge to get ready for your spring and summer garden. Um, you want to remember to plant uh, long lead time vegetables early. So again, you can use your winter gardening time to get ready for springtime by, uh, by getting your, the uh, long maturation uh, plants established early, started early. Um, green manures are an extra layer of protection. So uh, that's also planning for springtime gardening. And then uh, using season extenders for your spring plants, that's very much what you would do in the winter time as well. So season extenders come into play both in the winter and in the spring. Uh, and uh, you wanna get your starts growing inside and hardening off in your, in, I guess that would be late winter. And according to, um, to this, you're gonna to wanna to plant earlier than Mother's Day. This would be in-ground growing. And we might do that in the Verde, uh, depending on the, the temperatures, but I'm, I'm not real sure about Prescott. Um, but referring to your area's temperature chart is a, a great way to go. Look and see what's going on, uh, what is typical for, for your area before putting things in the ground and make sure that you do have uh, protection just in case you need it, in case there's a surprise frost. So uh, starting plants for spring. This, uh, you, we would use, I did use uh, my microgreen area for getting a head start on spring. It was still dark and cold outside, but I guess I was just anxious to get something going. And um, we, these are the things that you'll need to have. Uh, for to get a, a head start on spring. These are actually the grow trays here that we use for microgreens. And of course, I just use solo cups with holes in the bottom. Um, and part of winter planning or winter gardening to me is always getting seed catalogs, kind of like a wish book uh, for the next season. And so your winter gardening to-do list is this kind of a summary here, is number one, to find the best location. Sunshine plays an important role in that, the most important role in that. You want to select the seasonal vegetables that you favor, that you like, and plant them in order of their maturation rate. So you want to get the, long, the longer maturing uh, vegetables in the ground earliest. And uh, you want to source seeds 
for, for winter gardening and make sure that they are cold hardy vegetables or cold hardy plants. And you wanna plan for protection. So you wanna make sure that you have your covers, your cloches, your uh, row cover uh, sheets, bed sheets, whatever it is that you're gonna use uh, to cover your plants. You wanna make sure you have those on hand uh, for when the time comes. And the last thing you do in winter gardening is uh, use that time to plan for spring. So I will happy to take any questions now. So thank you, Kathy. That was so informative. Um, you want to go to the, your last slide while we're talking? Yeah, there we are. Okay. So um, the first question we had, and this is way early on as far as a reference point, is when you are getting your winter gardening ready, do you compost the plants that you remove or do you dispose of them? Oh, I, I compost them. Okay. Do you have any plants that you don't compost? I typically don't like to compost tomatoes. Um, those are, those are, if I do do that, I, I kind of keep them separate from the rest. Okay, more, more because they have pathogens possibly? They could, and um, I think it's because I, I really like to grow tomatoes, so I want to make sure that I keep that stuff separate okay. um, in case they have, in case that they do have pathogens. Now this year I was really lucky and they did extremely well. I had no blight, I had no, no strangeness going on in the garden. Um, but even then I would be careful about using the tomato plants in my compost. Okay. And then um, the straw bales, as far as the uh, enclosures um, for your, um, as you saw, a cover over uh, bales of hay, do the bale frames attract rodents? Um, uh, I haven't I, had that. Uh, I, haven't ha I haven't experienced that, no. And the hay bales, the straw bales are pretty tight. And they're on the ground, uh, I know. So you might have some breakdown at the bottom where the where the straw bales meet the ground. But I really haven't had any trouble using straw because generally there's no there's no grain in the straw to help to draw in the rodents. Okay. And then Bill asked, do you grow your pepper plants in containers or do you grow, transplant them for overwintering? You know, for overwintering, I ke I kept them in the container. Um, so I, I do have some in ground and then I have some in containers and I overwintered, uh, you could, you could do either way. I happen to use my container plants for overwintering, but I plan on doing the same with my in ground plants. And, and my personal experience, I grow all my tomatoes and peppers in containers just so I can have cages over them to prevent the, um, the rodents and creatures from eating. And then I move all of my container plants in my garage for the winter with grow lights yeah. and anything that's already fruited. I will get tomatoes and peppers through January and the plants will go dormant, but they stay alive for spring. Yes. Yes. So um, where do you get cover crop seeds? I can't seem to find a local source. And that's from Peter again. Um, you know, I... I, I believe I got mine from Azure Standard and I, I actually used uh, buckwheat last year. So I got the, I got buckwheat from Azure Standard. Uh, I would imagine you can get that from Johnny Seeds or- yeah, Bill Mains just said Johnny Seeds have a cover crop mix. Yeah, that, that's another place you could take a look. And let me keep going down here. Um, Corey asked, is the fit, fitted sheet is the fitted sheets is such a great idea and i actually wanted to know does that also protect from frost yes i think it does and it, it you know it depends on the location of your of your, your planter so if you know if that area is going to be shaded in the winter time where it wasn't in the summertime you know uh you, you'd probably want to be careful about that but i absolutely found that that covering with a sheet helped and then um, can a combination of green mulch and greens slash vegetables be planted in the winter garden? Garden. Uh, green mulch, well, I guess you could. Um, yeah, if you wanted to keep them separated. I don't, I, I think once they get to be two feet, it might be a little bit difficult to find your plants in there. Um, but that would be my only, the, the only reason I wouldn't do it. And then where do you get the grow mats from? 
the grow mats for the the microgreens yes i think true leaf is a good place to look for that stuff uh but any if you do a search for microgreen supplies and grow supplies they they will have your grow mats and i think trish was telling me that she uses grow mats as well yes and i think she does yeah george wanted to know have you used the tree cover that you portrayed in your picture Yes, I have. And the only issue I had with those is if it got really windy and the trees um, had pokey branches, I might get some holes in the tree cover, which was annoying because they're not cheap. Um, but, you know, you just use a little bit of tape on it or something like that. And that's how it goes. But the, they worked really well. The growing medium coconut core is, comp is compostable, is green, brown or green? I would call that a brown. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's it's it reminds you of peat moss in a way in terms of its consistency, but it is more sustainable. So it's it's a choice for people that are just going to be dumping out their um, dumping out their microgreens. Which again, when you're done harvesting the microgreens, it does make great compost, great element for your compost. Okay. And what's your favorite vegetable or vegetables to plant during the winter? During the winter time, I'm a big um, uh, a greens fan. So I go with the greens. I go with, uh, um, I actually, I put in uh, potatoes and I grow those pretty much all year round. As long as I pick the right spot. I like potatoes, um, grow beets, radishes, and carrots, but I'm a big greens fan. So the Swiss chard for me just is a, a great performer. Have you and ever grown um, um, garlic? Yes, I grew garlic. I don't think I got it in early enough uh, the last time and I had some very small heads. So I'm gonna be experimenting with better places to put it in my garden this year. Okay, so I don't have any other questions. And um, Kathy, I so appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us tonight. And it's my pleasure. For all of you out there, this recording and the PowerPoint will be available on the U of A website within a few days. And we will be having our next presentation on October, Thursday, October 28th, I believe it is. And it'll be permacultural, permacultural gardening and eco-free uh, gardening. So how to make the most with the less. So we hope to see you then. And we will have one more in November on worms you gotta love them and then we'll be dark in december so thank you all for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month thank you thank you, thank you. bye